Hello church family, it is good to be together even if we're together virtually. Uh, my name is David, if you don't normally tune in or don't normally meet together physically when we can do that. Um, let me uh, just read a, a passage from the Bible and then I'll pray and we can kick off with our service. Uh, the, the psalm I want to read, or part of it, is Psalm 139, where David says this, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. So isn't it great that wherever we are, God is with us. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to still virtually gather as a church family because we know that wherever we are, you are with us. We don't have to come to a, a special building or a special place. Lord, you are with us. And I pray that as we continue with our service today, that you would be encouraging us and challenging us as we uh, meet together in this way. Amen. Great. Well, we're now going to have our first reading and the all-age time from the Catons. Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to seventy years, or eighty if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass, and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendour to their children. May the favour of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Hi, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jane and I'm part of the For Life congregation. This week as a church we've all been reflecting on Psalm 90 and our family have been thinking about verse 12 but more about that later. First, here's my husband Tim and our kids Ethan and Naomi. So Tim, what have you got planned for today? Oh, not the ironing. Well that's a huge pile. That'll keep you busy all day. What else do you need to do? Oh, you have to go shopping. Do you have a lot of shopping to do? Is that all? No. 
Oh, you have to make dinner for everybody. Do you enjoy cooking? Oh dear. So what will you do after dinner? Oh, you're going to check your emails and Facebook and the news and the weather. You must be worn out. Perhaps it's time to put your feet up. <laughs> oh, you promised Ethan you'd go on a bike ride with him. And you promised Naomi you'd take the dog for a walk with her. Oh, hang on a minute. Didn't you say you wanted to read your Bible today and spend some time in prayer? Are you going to have time to do that? Oh dear. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Everything belongs to God, right? So that means time belongs to God too. God tells us to number our days. That doesn't mean we have to spend all day counting but it does mean we should make every day count. It's so easy to waste our days being too busy, like Tim was, or too lazy, or too grumpy to spend time with God. It's a real struggle to open our Bibles every day and to pray. How do you manage? Perhaps this week we can phone a friend or chat with our families or post on Facebook and share some encouragements and some wisdom as to how we can give God the best of our time every day. Tim's now going to close in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Father God, we know that our time is a gift from you and we want to make choices during our day that will bring us closer to you and closer to the people around us. We want our days to really count we want to spend our time doing things that really matter. Please help us to do that. And in the middle of all the craziness of life and all the many different ways we could spend our time, please help us to use it wisely. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We now come to our time of confession where we acknowledge that this week like every other week that we have lived, we have not lived up to God's standard. We have uh, we have displeased Him in in, in various ways, uh, and so with the words that will hopefully appear on the screen, let us confess our sins to our Father, and we'll say together, Almighty God, our heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Now, when David had sinned against God and confessed his sins, he wrote this in Psalm 32. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. When we confess our sins to the Lord, just like that, our sins are forgiven. Now we're going to continue in prayer with our intercessions. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your kindness to us, that we can come before you as forgiven sinners. Uh, we thank you for your utter love towards us. And on the basis of that love, Father, we pray uh, for the various things. And, and for, for starters, Lord, we pray for the USA, whose uh, cases of coronavirus have now uh, exceeded that of China. Lord, we pray for that country, 
as they deal with all these cases. Lord, p- please would you watch over them, protect them, help them to uh, keep their people safe. Uh, Lord, we pray for their uh, services, their their health workers and so on, as we, as we have been praying for our own in this country. Lord, we pray that you would... Uh, that you would protect those people and that not many people would die uh, and that your church would be able to offer hope in that country in this tricky time. And then, Lord, uh, more close to home, Lord, we pray for those people in our church family who are lonely at the moment um, and who are, are struggling with not having too much social interaction. Father, we know that uh, you are caring and compassionate Lord and we pray that as your church you would help us to reach out to one another uh, to pick up the phone or to to do a video call if we can do that sort of thing um, and to make sure that we're all doing okay Lord please help us to come together now more than ever as a church in support of the lonely people and lastly Lord we pray uh, for those people right now who will be um, having financial difficulties, uh, Lord, where work has dried up for so many of us. Father, we pray that uh, we would be able to trust in you uh, and not get too worried or anxious, but know that just in the same way that you clothe the flowers of the field of beauty and you provide food for the birds of the air, so you also you will watch over and care for your loved ones. Father, we pray uh, for the, the government as they uh, are kindly uh, offering much uh, money and help and grants to, to various workers. But Father, we pray that in, in this uh, time of financial difficulty that we would be able to reach out to you uh, and to put our trust more and more on you and depend on you. And we pray these things for the glory of your name. Amen. And now we're just going to close with the words that our Saviour taught us in the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're now going to have our second Bible reading, and then Andrew is going to preach the gospel to us. Matthew 3, verses 1 to 17. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea, and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptised by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptising, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptise you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. 
Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptised by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptised by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfil all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptised, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. In a moment, I'm going to pray, but just to say a couple of words of introduction. Uh, the first is that although we meet in very unusual circumstances, it's great to remember that when God's word is read and taught, uh, then what we're hearing is the real voice of our loving Heavenly Father. So we're used to saying, when two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them about church. Maybe this morning it's helpful to remember that when God's word is read, then he, the living God of the universe, speaks. So whether you and I are on our own at this point or with others, if we have the Bible open, we're listening to God's fatherly voice. And that's a great encouragement. Secondly, just to notice that we're just keeping on with our normal series of Bible teaching here at Hampton and Kingmore. Uh, we believe that we want to teach through the whole Bible, the bits we know already and the bits we don't, the bits that are slightly easier and slightly harder to teach. We just teach the whole Bible here. That's what we do. Because in teaching the whole Bible, then we hear the whole voice of our Heavenly Father. So our plan in the run-up to Easter was to come back to Matthew's Gospel that we were uh, enjoying back in December. That's why we're back in Matthew's Gospel this morning. I'm now going to pray. Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise you that your voice, your word is powerful, that it doesn't return to you empty, but it accomplishes the task that you've given it. Thank you that now, as we have listened to the reading and as we study together, you, the living God, are speaking. We pray you make us your hearing, listening and obeying people. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to imagine that you've had a phone call and you've been told very suddenly that the Queen is coming to visit your house on Thursday. Now I know that wouldn't happen in the time of COVID-19, but I want you to imagine it. You've had a phone call from her equerry or whoever would make, I don't know, I've never had the Queen visit my house. Whoever makes that call, they phoned up and they said, Her Majesty requests the pleasure of visiting your house on Thursday. And I want you to imagine what would you do? How would you feel? Now, if your house looks anything like ours, there might be a hint of panic. Presumably, you'd want to get your house cleaned up and doled up. Cleaned up, then remove all the dirt. You might want to check the carpets, hoover that bit there, uh, get out that stain there. You'd want to get it all cleaned up, uh, and then you'd want to get it doled up. Uh, those, those really precious treasures, uh, your family's favourite photos, they'd be quickly framed, wouldn't they? They'd be put on the wall in prominent places in the hope that Her Majesty might say, who's that? And you could say, oh, that's my hero, you know, my, my great uncle who won the Victoria's Cross or so on and so on. You'd get cleaned up and you'd get doled up. And uh, you see that, you might remember some times in your head where we've seen people getting ready for the Queen to arrive. I think back to Westminster Abbey in 2011 uh, for William and Kate's wedding. Do you remember how beautiful it looked? They even had trees uh, down the aisle. And uh, up on that big communion table right at the front, they've got all their gold treasures, their um, crosses and their candlesticks and their, and their plates and things because her majesty was coming they got cleaned up and doled up now these verses in matthew chapter 3 don't focus on queen elizabeth ii arriving but on someone much more important they focus on god's chosen king arriving 
and through John the Baptist, the call comes out to everybody, are you ready? Are you ready? He's coming. Or in verse three's words, prepare the way for the Lord. Get ready for God to arrive in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. How would you feel if God was going to turn up to your house on Thursday? God who knew every single thing about you, your past, your present, your future, the words you had said and hadn't said, the thoughts you'd thought. How do you feel if God was going to turn up? The need to be ready would be much more urgent than if just royalty were coming. Because God would see much more than external dirt. He'd see the thoughts of our hearts. They'd be open before him. Anyway, hold that thought of the Queen coming because that encapsulates these verses. I think you see three little things in these verses. The fact that we need to repent, that the test for repentance, and the solution for the repentant. So the need of repentance, the test of repentance, and the solution for the repentant. Let's look together then at verses one to six, the need for repentance. It's very clear, isn't it, there in verse two. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And it's explained in verse three, as we've already seen, by preparing the way for the Lord. How do you get ready for God's arrival in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ? You repent, verse two, or you confess your sins, verse six. You clean yourself up to be ready for God. But the problem is, repent is a Bible word, isn't it? It's one of those words that many of us have heard many times. But how do you actually understand it? What does it mean? Well, let me give you three words beginning with C. We've got some pictures uh, to go with them. Uh, three words beginning with C uh, that explain what repentance isn't and what it actually is. You need to do confession. That is, you need to admit you're wrong. But you need to go further, to quote the government in the recent weeks. We need to go further. Uh, you need to do contrition. Contrition is being sorry that you're wrong. But you need to go further. Repentance is change. Repentance is intention not to do something again. Let me give you a picture of each of those so you can understand what actual repentance would look like. This is so helpful, by the way, for those of us who are tuning in, who perhaps are looking into Christianity, perhaps are turning uh, and, and considering life, the universe and everything in these times when, when death feels more real, death feels more likely. If, if you're thinking these things through, this is particularly helpful because Jesus' first recorded words in the Bible, <coughs> repent for the kingdom of God is near. This is gonna be really important. So here we are, confession, contrition, and change. Confession on its own isn't repentance. And the image for that is a footballer um, who's been called by the ref for a late tackle. And the, and the footballer says, oh, I'm sorry, ref. And all he's doing is he's just trying to get the referee off his back. He's maybe trying to avoid the red card. Although you can see from the picture that in this person's case, uh, he didn't manage to avoid it. Many of us can think of footballers who are prone to what's known now as a professional foul. That they'll do it, they'll get caught doing it, they'll say sorry, but you know flat out that in a month's time, in the same situation, they'd do it again. It's not repentance, it's just confession. Sorry ref, no intention to change lives. That wouldn't be a Christian, would it? What about confession and then contrition? That, I think, is like a dieter uh, with a chocolate cake on their lap. Uh, I think most of you know me well enough to know that I'm a uh, self-confessed chocoholic, so I have some sympathy here. But the dieter who feels sorry about the chocolate they ate yesterday and feels guilty about the fact that they're now eating chocolate has confessed, that's the sorry, and has the guilt, that's contrition, that's the regret, but as you can see from this photo, they're still eating the chocolate. So they've confessed and they're sad, but they haven't changed their life. I think of a young man I used to know many years ago, he used to come on summer camp every year, he used to love the Bible teaching, he used to really enjoy being around all of us on that camp. It was an amazing place. 
And every year, in two or three of the talks, he would be weeping, weeping over his sin. But the problem is he never put his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and he never changed his life. So he confessed and he was contrite. He just didn't repent. He wouldn't actually change his life. Well, John the Baptist, the message is simple. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And that's why there's the third C, confession, contrition, change. Change is the intention not to do it again. Change is vital to true repentance. It's the turning round through 180 degrees. Now, I remember when I, uh, remember I, I used to be a, a, a cadet officer when I was a school teacher, and we had a school cadet force. And you get sent away on a weekend to, to learn um, how to put your uniform on, how to wear your cap, and all those sort of things, how to salute. And I still remember being taught how to do an about turn uh, by a sergeant who'd got a new pair of shoes on. So he came out to demonstrate to us how to do an about turn, and he'd got these really shiny shoes on, and he'd put those clicky things, those metal clicky things, under his heels and under his toes, and he hadn't done an about turn with those on. So he marches down in front of us, goes for a spin, and because of the metal, he spins way out of control and nearly falls over on the parade ground. And it was hysterical. Uh, you can see from the soldier in this photo that, that uh, he, he has at least repented 180 degrees compared to everybody else. Imagine trying to uh, about turn without changing direction. Makes no sense, does it? John the Baptist says, God's coming. God's coming. You've got to repent. Uh, that does include admitting you're wrong. Uh, it does include being sorry that you're wrong, but admitting it to the ref, being sorry as you eat the chocolate cake and not repentance. A resolution to live differently. That's what John the Baptist is talking about. That's what Jesus calls all of us to do, to repent. And the big surprise in the passage is the people to whom it's said. It's said to these people to emphasize the fact that we really do need to repent. These are good Jews. These are seriously religious people from Jerusalem. They live in Jerusalem, for goodness sake. That was quite offensive to them, I expect. God's chosen people, with God heritage coming out of every pore of their body, and they're called to repent. Really striking, isn't it, in English censuses, when they count up population and how people self-identify. Um, 10 years ago, 50 million identified as Christian in this country, but less than 2 million of those would go to church even once a month. It's a claim to Christianity that's making no difference in their lives. And the point here for Matthew's readers would have been that if sincere Jews had to repent, then surely everybody had to repent. God in Jesus came to call all Jews to repentance and faith. And in fact, everybody, all of absolutely anybody and everybody, to repentance and faith. God's coming. There's a need for repentance. But secondly, there's a test for repentance. Verses 7 to 12. And John the Baptist here is slightly mocking the religious people, isn't he? Here you've got the Pharisees uh, and the Sadducees. These were religious and, and political groups. Uh, verse 7, many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming out to where he was baptizing. And he says to them, who warned you to flee? He, he, he's, he's being quite sharp with them. But you see, they thought they were right with God. And so they didn't think they needed to repent. And how does John the Baptist teach us to understand if we really have done that? Verse 8, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Verse 10, the axe is laid to the root of the tree and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down. Twice in just these few verses, the test for repentance is fruit. That is we're living differently. So if you and I are Christians who've actually repented, we'll be, we'll be able to look through each day and through each action and through each thought and through each decision and think, I would do that differently if I wasn't a Christian. I would spend my money differently if I wasn't a Christian. I'd spend my time differently if I wasn't a Christian. I would speak differently 
The way I play football would be different if I wasn't a Christian. I might try and get away with a foul. I might not uh, congratulate someone for scoring a good goal. We should be able to look at each bit of our life and say, this is where I'm living differently. Uh, I'm not just confessing and I'm not just contrite. I'm actually changing. So the fruit could be gentleness, patience, peacefulness, mercy, purity, and righteousness, all of which occur in Matthew chapter 5 and the Sermon on the Mount. The fruit will certainly be loving Jesus and living to serve him and not ourselves in sacrifice for others without counting the cost. And do you see why it matters? It matters, verse 10, because the fruitless tree will be cut down. One day, everyone will either be burnt up or gathered into God's barn, verse 12. That's the day of wrath, verse 7, that's coming, that the religious people in John the Baptist's time fail to flee from. Really striking, isn't it? Jesus is going to come back one day, and he's going to come back like a thief in the night. We're not going to know when he's going to come. And you and I have just recently had a very vivid illustration of how that's going to feel. Because two months ago, who could have imagined that the world would feel like it does today? None of us. And many of us would go back a month or two and think, I'd love to have done that differently if I knew this was coming. But it's been a total surprise. So I didn't do it. Well, the end of the world will be a total surprise too when Christ returns in all his glory with a trumpet voice and the archangel. It would be really tragic if some of us said that day, oh, I didn't think it was coming. So I never got ready. John the Baptist says, prepare the way for the Lord. How do we prepare it? We repent. That's what we all need to do. And what's the test for that? It's fruit. You'll know if you've repented because you'll be living differently. And there is a little warning in here, isn't there? These Jews thought that because they were religious, they didn't need to repent. There's a great tragedy that there are many who would sit in pews in church buildings up and down our land, who again think that they're okay because they're going to church. Think that they're okay because they live in a Christian country, whatever that means. Think that they're okay because their mum was a Christian or their gran was a Christian. But there are no such things as grandchildren of Christians. They're not Christians. We have to each repent. And just because your granny was baptised when she was a baby doesn't make any of us a Christian. We each have to turn in personal faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Today would be a great day to do that. It'd be a great day to do that. You'd be really welcome to contact me afterwards and I'd love to pray with you, talk with you, explain it all to you and indeed do my very best to answer all the questions you might have. But thirdly then, you get not just the need to repent and the test for repentance, you get the solution for the repentant in verses 13 to 17. I absolutely love this bit. If you're feeling a little bit worried so far with the passage, you have to read on to these verses. They're absolutely great. We can't solve our own problems. At the heart of Christianity is the fact that we can't save ourselves. We need God to do that. That's the healthy self-despair that Jesus is seeking to bring about in the beginning of Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who know they can't do it. And John the Baptist isn't the end of the story because look at verse 11. One more powerful is coming. Baptism with the Holy Spirit will be available for fruitful repentance. All the way through Matthew, there's been this emphasis on fulfillment. Fulfill, fulfill, fulfill. In this passage, verse 3, Isaiah, verse 4, Elijah, a bit of two kings, and this judgment theme throughout the whole Old Testament. And in verse 15, we see that Jesus' baptism fulfills all righteousness. Jesus is embodying the true Son of God, Israel. Do you remember in, in the previous chapter that we saw at Christmas time, Jesus goes to Egypt, for example. And then they come back from Egypt to fulfill, out of Egypt, I have called my son. And Jesus now is baptised to fulfill what God's people, God's son, 
Israel should do. He fulfills all righteousness. Here you see the Pharisees out in the desert failing to repent. And you see Jesus Christ in the desert fulfilling all righteousness. And heaven breaks open and God the Father says, This is my Son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased, verse 17. This is Jesus doing for Israel what Israel could not do for themselves. And in fact, he's doing it for everyone who will turn to him. That's the call and the offer to all. That's worth just being really clear, but the Holy Spirit doesn't come now on Jesus because he was absent beforehand. No, the visible giving of the Spirit here is part of the public commissioning and equipping of Jesus as the perfect Israel, ready for the ministry that we're going to see next week as he's banished and tempted in the desert. One of my very favourite passages, but that's next week. The focus here has been on repentance, and it's now on Christ's perfection. Why is that? Well, the need for repentance reminds us that none of us are acceptable to God the Father. And the baptism and affirmation of Jesus show that he is now acceptable to God the Father. He always was, and he is, and it's proved in public. So go back to the Queen visiting you on Thursday. You've got the call from Buckingham Palace. It's Her Majesty's Equerry here. I'm coming round on Thursday, and you've put down the phone, and you're in a total panic because the wall needs painting and the carpet's not quite right and 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 you've got this great big list what am I going to do to get ready for her majesty coming around on Thursday and you panic I mean who wouldn't panic and you start trying to get cleaned up but it, you can't do it you start looking in the shelves and in, in your drawers for all those treasures to put out to impress her majesty and you can't find them and then on wednesday a really big car pulls up outside your house and you think oh no she's come a day early but it's prince charles it's prince charles and he knocks on your door and he says hi there mum's coming around tomorrow isn't she yeah, I'm terrified. How can I make my house ready? Calm down. Don't worry. I've been getting my bedroom ready for my mum for over 60 years. And I'm here to help. Let me show you how to make your house ready for mum. Can you imagine how that would be? I know my mum. I know just what she wants. I've brought loads of my treasures from Highgrove. We can put them out for you. I've brought some great paintings and some beautiful silver plates. I've even brought a handmade Italian suit that you can wear and a really nice tie. Let me do it for you. I can make you acceptable to my mum. That's what Jesus does, isn't it? In his perfection, in his obedience, he is acceptable to God the Father. He's the perfect Israel. He's doing for those people then and anybody who trusts in him today he's doing for us what we could never do for ourselves that's why we sing very often in church before the throne of god above Do you remember when satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within up would i look and i see him there who made an end to all my sin. The Christian's faith and hope and trust is not in ourselves. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. We express that by repenting, confessing, being contrite, and changing from our sins. We express it by looking at Jesus Christ's perfection, by hearing that Father's voice, this is my Son whom I love, and putting our trust in Him and not ourselves, and confident in him, we pray for ongoing fruit of that repentance in changes all the way across every part of our lives. In a minute, uh, there's a chance for you to listen to some of the songs that we've suggested that fit with this Bible passage. You can see them uh, linked into uh, on the screen, find them online. Uh, why not enjoy some of those words? Um, if you're with someone, why not turn to them and discuss uh, what we've heard? Um, if you're not with someone, why not pick up the phone or, or send a text? And uh, it's great to let the Word of God dwell in us richly as we teach and encourage each other with all His wisdom.
But anyway, as we close our formal time together here, I'm just going to pray for us all. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we are just like every single other human being in the whole wide world. We all need to repent. And thank you so much, our Father, that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, does for us what we could never do for ourselves. Thank you that he's the perfect Israel, the perfect son. And thank you that trusting in him makes us perfect in your sight. Father, we pray for each other that in these difficult times that we'll be every day uh, turning to the Lord Jesus Christ and not just confessing our sins and not just being sorry about our sins with contrition, but seeking change as we're inspired by him, as we know the power of your word and your Holy Spirit in us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.